Well, good morning, WPC, and welcome to this weekend's digital worship service. Here at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Westlake Village, we believe that we're all invited to follow Jesus on a journey of faith, friendship, and service. And over the last five or six weeks or so, we've been looking at ways that God shows up on our journey. We've been exploring God's faithfulness. This morning, we're looking some at the defining moments in Moses' life. Now, as we begin our service together, will you please join with me in prayer? Loving God, as we enter this time of worship, remind us that we are stepping onto holy ground. As we open your word, grant us clear minds and open our hearts to what you might be doing in our midst. As we sing songs of praise, fill our homes with hope and with peace. Draw us in and give us the courage to come to you openly and honestly. We pray these things in your name. Amen. first reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. It's the the call of Saul, and I'll be reading from the NRSV. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Growing up, whenever I would go to big church in the sanctuary with my parents, one of the most difficult parts of the entire worship service was the pastoral prayer or the the prayers of the people. The longer the prayer went, the harder it was for me to pay attention, to focus. And before long, my mind would wander to wherever a little boy's mind wanders during church. And I'd look around and I'd say, what's happening? I'd think about sports. I'd think about school or the pancakes I was going to eat after church. 
It's something I struggled with for a long, long time, well into high school. And then someone uh, who mentored me, they, they shared what they did during that time to focus. They, they pictured themselves along with the entire church kneeling before God. Whoever was talking, whoever was praying would, would stand up and would walk in front of the congregation, speaking on behalf of the congregation, uh, approaching God. It just helped me to focus on both the words that were being prayed, the words that were being shared, and on the person they were being shared with. It's something I still practice today. So as we turn to prayer this morning, both from our homes and from here in our sanctuary, may we approach the God of grace and truth together. Let's pray. Holy, 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 the earth is filled with your glory. We praise you, O God of creation. In the beginning, you separated light from darkness and made all living and non-living things. And you trusted us to take care of what you created. We praise you, O God of grace and mercy. You draw us in and give us purpose. You give us meaningful work and invite us to be a part of what you are doing in the world today. We praise you, O God of forgiveness. There are times during this last week where, where we simply fell short, where we turned our eyes or our backs to the rest of the world, where we miss out sometimes on the good that is around us and seek to drag others down instead of building them up. Forgive us. We praise you, O God, who knows all things. You know where we're in pain, you know who among us is grieving and hurting, and you know that some of us are terrified of what tomorrow will bring, even if we can't articulate it. Meet us where we sit. Holy God, we pray these things in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have been following on a theme called God's faithfulness, uh, looking at the personalities specifically of individuals in the Old Testament. This morning, we're going to look at Moses, and there's no personality any larger than Moses. Let me just give you a background before we read the text of where we are. Moses' mother had given birth, and because there was a price out for Hebrew children, she put the child up for adoption, and by floating him in, a, in the river. He was adopted by Egyptian royalty. He grew up in the Egyptian court. He was well-educated. In his adulthood, early adulthood, he saw a taskmaster beating on a slave, which was his people, and he killed him. Thinking that he would get away with it, he buried him. And then sooner or later, he's on the run. It's known. Goes to Midian out in the wilderness, defends some of the women there against abuse by men, and they go back and tell their father, Jethro, about it. It ends up that Moses marries one of Jethro's daughters. He's gone from royalty to being a sheep herder. He's laying low. He's a fugitive. You're not supposed to make yourself known, unrecognized, unreported. That's the context in which we catch the scripture this morning from the third chapter of Exodus, if you'd like to read along. Let's listen. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. 
Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see what the bush is, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is no accident. Moses is called by name. It's a moment of decision. It's a moment of an accumulation of decision from his mother's decision to let him go. His decision to stand up to abuse. His decision to come together at Mount Horeb where he was just tending sheep. There are a couple of deciding moments in this scene. One is when he sees the burning bush, he's curious. Doesn't walk away, doesn't run away. He wants to see why. It's his inquisition, his curiousness. And then he hears the word, Moses, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. And that's the second decision he made, not to run. I see people who say, I don't like this religious stuff, I'm out of here. Moses sticks around, he wants to hear more. He wanted to hear more about people. I think, and more about justice. It was not easy. Pretty soon, the Lord starts telling him what he's going to do. And beginning at that, Moses begins to back off. He backs away. He gives excuses. What if those people don't listen to me? I don't speak well. The Lord says, I'll give you a brother. The Lord has an answer for every one of his objections. Maybe they won't believe me, but in the end, Moses says, Lord, just send somebody else. But he doesn't. Moses, I am calling you. It was a defining moment. It's a yes or no. It's the question that Moses had to raise. Why and how did I get here? Why am I here? Same thing happened to the Apostle Paul. We read about that scripture earlier when he's on the Damascus Road and he's out killing Christians. The Lord says, why are you persecuting me? With Moses, what do I do with this? It's penetrating. It's perceptive. It's provocative. I can't let go of it. I can't leave it. I think we've all had moments, defining moments, in which we've made decisions. I mean, the question is, how did you get here where you are today? Was it an accident, a series of events, or maybe were it an accumulation of defining moments and decisions? I've been listening to some of our teens recently who are making college decisions, places where they go to school and Sometimes that's hard, and they talk about one school, and I've enjoyed listening to some of you tell about the advantages and the disadvantages and and the throes of making a decision. These are defining moments. Where you go to school may determine a lot about your life. It may determine where you'll do your career or where you'll work out your career. It may be where you find a spouse. Important decisions and decisions that aren't to be taken lightly with a lot of thought, a lot of investigation, and I think a lot of prayer. We've generally made decisions if we're married. We had a choice to make. I don't know how you made those choices, whether to be married or not, or who you married, but they are defining moments. Sometimes we make mid-course corrections. Not all marriages work out. But it's how do we make our decisions? 
Well, let me throw some ideas to you. I'm kind of a pragmatist. I make lists, pros, cons. What am I thinking about? Prayer. And sometimes in that prayer, I'll simply ask, Lord, am I missing something? Is there something I don't want to deal with? And then I sleep on it. I also run it by friends. I like to know what's going on, but most of all, I need to look at what I'm not looking at sometimes and then to sleep on it. And then the next day I look at it and see, should I make a decision or not? Defining moments, we need to take them very, very seriously. The other part to this is in your defining moments, be open to surprises. I must say that I have made thoroughly investigative decisions and ended up in the right places for the wrong reasons. You just don't know. Sometimes I've been in a place, it was a hard place, and I asked, why am I here? Did I make a big mistake? And yet looking back on those decisions, I realize how much I've grown and what I've learned in those times. So part of these defining moments is a sense of patience. We don't see it sometimes in the short time, in the short terms, but perhaps even in the uncomfortable places, we need to understand that perhaps we're standing on holy ground. There's something to be done and there's something to be learned. I've also learned over these many, many years to be open to change. We change, our circumstances change. I've watched some of you go through these hard decisions. Shall we move closer to family as we get older? That's a hard decision. Those are defining moments because it changes much of your life and how you leave friends and how you go to new opportunities. And we've had some do that very recently. It's a hard decision. My wife and I are looking at the same kind of thing. Long term, do we want to be closer to our children or do they want to be closer to us? That's another question. All marriages end at one time or another by death or divorce. Sometimes those are cast upon us. Some decisions we choose to make and some are made for us. And so as long as we are living, we are making some form of mid-course corrections or dealing with something. Sometimes I hear people say, let go and just let God. I must say I have a little difficulty with that because I don't think disengaging from the decisions is a good idea, but I do think listening is incredibly important. So God, what is it you want me to do? I'm listening, listening with my heart. The Lord said to Moses, simply, I will be with you. There are no guarantees in this walk of faith. There are no guarantees against cancer. There's no long guarantees that we will have a long life or a short life. There are no guarantees about our health there are no guarantees about our financial futures. Things happen. There simply aren't any guarantees, except at one point we remember that whatever we're in, God is faithful and is with us there. At some point along the way, as with Moses, and he had a long life, and he had a lot of events, is that we have to pass the baton. I've been in many services where we have passed the baton and we've listened and we've talked and we've given thanks for lives. The good news is that this is not about Moses' faithfulness. It's not about Israelites' faithfulness. It's about the journey and God's faithfulness. It's not about the Israelites' faithfulness. My goodness, we happen to know that every time we turn around, they're complaining. Why did you bring us out here to die? Are we going to starve to death? Then they begin to make golden calves and they start worshiping snakes. Complain, take us back home. We don't want to die out here. The Lord promises bread for the day. We even say it in our Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. 
piece that is most comforting to me is that it's God who takes the initiative. It was not Moses. Moses wasn't looking for God when he was up there on the mountain. He was just trying to care, care of some cattle and sheep. God finds him in the place, in a hiding place, and calls him by name. And God goes to the slaves and leads them to a new land. It's God who shows the compassion. And it's God who equips Moses. And it's God who gave the direction and the rules to live by. So how will we respond? We have choices. No one can ever take away our ability to make a decision, our choice. Our circumstances may not be changeable, but how we respond to them is. And so when we come to the time that we have lived our journey and we pass the baton, we're in our final resting place. We use and we hear words like this, trusting in God. By God's grace, by God's direction, by God's forgiveness, these are our defining moments. And to this we simply say, thanks be to God. Westminster, Catherine here with this week's Life Together. Our Engaging in the Enneagram workshop continues to gather on Tuesdays in the WPC Courtyard. Just a friendly reminder that the group will not meet this Tuesday, but will gather for the next time on Tuesday, May 25th at 1230 p.m. We're looking forward to continuing this conversation, and if you're interested in joining us, feel free to send me a quick email. We invite you to support our SYF group at our restaurant fundraiser this Wednesday, May 19th. Join us at Sharky's Wood-Fired Mexican Grill in Westlake Village anytime from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the 19th. Be sure to mention Westminster Presbyterian Church SYF when you order takeout or dine in person. A big thank you in advance to continuing to support our youth ministries. And this Thursday, May 20th at 5 p.m., we'll be hosting our very first Third Thursday Prayer in the WPC Prayer Garden. This gathering will be led by J.R. Robertson and members of the Adult Christian Formation Committee as a time of prayer-filled reflection and meditation together. We look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And next Sunday, May 23rd, from 2 to 3.30 p.m., We'll be hosting a joint middle school and high school girls event. We invite you to join us for a mall scavenger hunt and frozen yogurt at the Oaks Mall in Thousand Oaks. We'll divide up into small groups, mixing our middle and high school girls and race around the mall for a competitive and fun picture scavenger hunt. This event is open to any incoming sixth graders all the way through our outgoing 12th graders as a way to get to know each other and build stronger relationships. Be sure to register your daughter by emailing myself or following the link found in the weekly. We continue with our lunch making project with Harbor House and May's lunch making project is coming up really soon. We invite you to sign up to make lunches from home on May 22nd, 24th or 25th and deliver them directly to Harbor House to support our neighbors in need. Each month, WPC has teamed up to provide around 200 lunchers for Harbor House, and we're so excited to continue this project this month. Be sure to sign up through the link also found in the weekly. We also invite all to join the Adult Christian Formation Committee on Thursday, May 27th for our dinner and a movie Zoom debrief conversation. We'll be discussing the film Invictus, 
a 2009 film about Nelson Mandela and his unique venture to unite South Africa with the help of the national rugby team. We invite you to watch the movie at home anytime before the Zoom debrief and dinner on Thursday, May 27th at 6 p.m. We also invite you to save the date for an exciting joint WPC and Lightshine Church program happening on Thursday, June 3rd at 6 p.m. in the courtyard, and it'll be a conversation around climate change. Dr. Kevin Bowman and Reverend Dr. Richard Lyon will be leading the conversation, talking about the intersection between science and scripture. We invite you to join us a bit ahead of time at 5.30 p.m. before the presentation begins at 6 for a bring your own picnic dinner in the courtyard. A $10 suggested donation is being asked to provide our gracious speakers with an honorarium. The presentation will begin right at six o'clock and we ask that you do register ahead of time to let us know you'll be joining. The link to that can be found in tomorrow's weekly. And this week we launched our Pentecost special offering. The Pentecost offering is the second of the Presbyterian Church's four yearly special offerings. WPC will be receiving this offering next Sunday, May 23rd, which is Pentecost Sunday. Also a friendly reminder to wear red to church on Pentecost. A gift to this special offering helps the church encourage, develop, and support its young people, and also address the needs of at-risk children. Something really unique is that 40% of the Pentecost offering is retained by our congregation as we make an impact in the lives of young people within our own community. The remaining 60% is used to support children at risk, youth, and young adults through ministries of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. We encourage you to support this special offering as we collect it next Sunday, May 23rd. And if you came prepared to give an offering this morning, we invite you to do so online through our website, wpcwestlake.org, by texting WPC Give to 77977 or mailing your donation here into the office. And now as we conclude our service, let's join together in our closing song. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. From my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer.
So as we leave, we go with these words. The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit go with you today, tomorrow, forever. You can trust it. Amen. Thank you.